everyone a Merry Christmas Eve as everybody heads back to their seats. We want to start off by welcoming our visitors. If you're visiting with us this morning, you are our honored guest. If you would grab a, uh, a visitor card out of the pew in front of you, fill it out, drop it in the offering box on the way out the door, and we'll send you some information about our church. We're looking forward to 
continuing our sermon series this morning on the Advent in Luke chapter 2, Hope Celebrated. By way of announcements, uh, the first one, Christmas cards. We've got a Christmas card rack in the vestibule, so if you haven't checked that this morning, go ahead and check it before you leave, uh, because after tomorrow, they won't be Christmas cards, they'll be New Year's cards, so grab those on the way out the door. We want to invite you to come back tonight at 5 p.m. to our annual Christmas Eve uh, candlelight service. It's a great way to prepare your heart for Christmas Day. It's going to be a short service, probably 40, 45 minutes. Uh, We're starting early, so you've got plenty of time to uh, do all your family gatherings afterwards. What we hope is that you'll make this uh, an annual event for your family and just come back every year. Uh, Bring back uh, any members of your family you'd like. It's always a very solemn service and just a wonderful time, like I say, to prepare your heart for Christmas Day. We won't have a Wednesday night service this week. We're going to probably do that for a few weeks to give our folks some time to rest and re-energize. So uh, we'll just keep you posted on that as the weeks uh, go by. We've got our men's breakfast on January the 7th, so go ahead and get that on your calendar. We've got a foster parent uh, respite care training January 11th through February the 15th. And there's going to be a student overnight on New Year's Eve. For our missions moment this morning, we've got a video from Adam and Andy Gregg. Many-
in our time of confession time this morning. Um, last week I had in our class, we went over some this, this chapter in our small group class in the morning. It's not really a, a chapter about confession, but it's a chapter about who the Lord is. Uh, it's about um, his providence and his majesty and who he is. So it's, it's Psalm 34. Um, I greatly appreciate Jenny and her love for the Psalms. I've never, never really thought much about it. It's been scripture, it's been text before, but man, it, the last several years, you know, we, we've gone through quite a bit of Psalms, seems like, in here in different, different aspects. But just the, the connection that we have with the psalmist as he's praising the Lord. But also, as he goes through difficult times, um, Scripture speaks to us. And so as we have a kindred spirit. With, in Christ, we have the same spirit. So it's, um, it's, it, it can speak to us and, and um, minister to us as we read through the Psalms. So Psalm 34, um, I'll just read a few of these, these verses. Um, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul make it, makes its boast in the Lord. Let me humble, let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. There's a song by Shane and Shane that just it resonates when they're singing that. My heart sings that. I remember up here speaking one time, and I was coughing. You remember me, remember me coughing all the time, I don't know, but I couldn't sing because my, I had a, a cough. But man, it was re- the song we were singing was just resonating with me. The Lord, it was, it was praising the Lord, it was glorifying who he was. And this is what the psalm is, is helping us do, is glorifying the Lord together. Magnify the Lord with me. He's calling the, the listener to, to sing praises to the Lord. That's what Scripture is helping us with here. Let us exalt his name together, it says in verse 3. Um, verse 8, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. So if you are a believer, you're taking refuge in Christ. He, he, is, he is your security. He is your hope. He is the one that you have your, your security in for all eternity. Not in your circumstance, not in your ability to attain things in life, not in your charisma, your, your good attitude. Your hope is only in Christ, only in Him. Verse 15, the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and His ears toward their cry. That doesn't mean His, his eyes and ears are toward you because of your good works. Who are the righteous? Those who have submitted to Christ. Those whose faith is in Him. Those who've repented and by faith put their, put their trust in what the Lord's done on the cross. His ears, His eyes are toward you as a believer. In our time of confession, that is a hopeful thing. That is a thing that encourages us, that, that pulls us to the Lord, is that He hears us. His, his ears and eyes are attentive to to our pleas, to our heartache, um, to our joy and to our rejoicing, yes, but also to our difficult times and diff- difficult situations. Verse 17, when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the broken heart and saves the crushed in spirit. Verse 22, the Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. What a joyful message for us to hear that our, our hope and our eternity is secure in Christ. There's no condemnation that we will experience in Christ. There's re- rebuke. The Spirit chastises. The, re- the Spirit can convict us of our sin. And praise the Lord for that as well. But it says that there, none of those who take refuge in Him will be condemned. So as a believer, it's a time to rejoice, be thankful, and to, uh, to come to Him willingly. But if you're not a believer, if your hope is not in Christ, if your security is not secured in what Christ did on the cross, that doesn't apply to you. You will be condemned. That's the end result is condemnation and judgment if your faith is not in Christ. So in this time of confession, maybe it's time to confess the Lord is Lord. And for the first time, maybe in your life, recognize that Christ is Lord. He is who He says He is. He's the one that deserves my submission. He's the one that deserves me to to come to Him 
bowed down before him as he's Lord of lords and King of kings. And as believers, we already recognize that. So it's a joyful time for us to come to him, praising him for what he does, because it says, the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. His ears are toward their cry. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears, delivers them out of their troubles. So what a rejoicing thing we can, we as confessing people can come to the Lord, knowing that we won't be turned away, just recognizing who he is. And as a loving father, he wants us to come to him, desires us to come to him so he can extend that grace to us. He's not your father yet. That opportunity is there for you as well to come to him so that his grace can be extended to you. So in this time of confession, if, if you're a believer, think about the things this week, maybe even today, where maybe we've forgotten about his grace. We've taken it for granted. I have. And we, we haven't given him his rightful place as Lord in our life this week. And if you're not a believer, recognize that. Con- confess your sins to him, that you're a, a sinner, that you deserve hell. But because of his grace, uh, you, you desire to be made one with Christ. So call to the Lord. As a believer, as an unbeliever, call out to the Lord. Father, we thank you for who you are. Lord, help us to to recognize the things in our life that that don't please you. Lord, for all of us, that would be a long list. Help us to recognize those things and, and change our attitudes, Father. Change our mindset to be more like Christ. Help us in our weak areas. Father, as believers, we thank you for making us more like Christ, even though we're not fully mature yet and we won't be there until we get to heaven. But, Father, we thank you for the work you're you're doing in our lives. You're causing us to sin less. You're causing us to desire you more. And you're causing us to to have good works um, that glorify you. So, Father, we thank you for that. For any who don't know you, Lord, may today they recognize sin, recognize that there is a solution to that, and it's only found in Christ. Praise you for who you are. Preston, we pray. Amen. Now stand with us, please, and we continue our service.
who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Yeah. 
scripture reading this morning comes to us from Luke chapter 2, verses 22 through 35. It is page 1019 in your Black Pew Bible. Luke chapter 2, verses 22 through 35. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people Israel. And the father and his mother marveled at what they had said about him, and Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Yeah. 
Appreciate the worship team getting that together. We love music and we love to sing truth. We got to sing truth this morning. Appreciate that. I want to invite our children, second grade and under, to line up at the door. We're going to take you back and teach you the word, second grade and under. If you need to, parents, you need to, if you want to take them back and get them settled and come back out here, you can do that. We're really glad you're here. It's Christmas season, and we are um, glad you're here. If you're here for the first time, uh, hope you come back. Hope you're blessed this morning. Our teaching text is Luke chapter 2, the text that Jeff read for us. You can turn there in your Bibles. We'll be flipping around a couple of different places this morning. If you don't have a Bible, there's a, that Black Pew Bible he alluded to. You can pick that up, page 1019. That's where we'll be at in Luke chapter 2. We celebrate a lot of different things in life. Celebrate when good things happen. We celebrate victories. We celebrate accomplishments. And I was thinking about that this week. Our title of the message is Hope Celebrated. And I was thinking about when I was in high school and our junior year, we played baseball, um, and we got to the championship game of the state tournament We were when we got beat. And so uh, get that close, and you lose a game, and you go from being the champion to being just runner-up. And runner-up stinks, right? And so we, the next year, coming back our senior year, we only lost one or two people. I don't know. Lonnie, help me. We lose one or two. I don't remember. But we had, we had everybody coming back, and so there's a lot of, ex, you know, uh, expectations were really high, and we worked really hard, and we played ball, and, um, you know, you can be the best team and not win. That happens all the time, doesn't it, Blake? You know, you can be the best team, the, the most uh, gifted, uh, sometimes the, the, the best coached, and just not win it. So our senior year, we worked really hard, and, and we got to the championship game, and, and our senior year, we won the tournament a pretty big deal for kids you know that you know your whole life especially as an unregenerate person that's like what's really really important to you you know and so but I was thinking about the celebration there and you, you celebrate different ways we have some pictures of those I called a buddy Spence and I thought he would have some pictures and he did but here's some pictures this is after the the win everybody comes and you got some they're high five and you got some they're hugging you got some that are dog piling right dog piling I wasn't on the bottom I was too little to be on the bottom of that pile but you got the dog pile going on. But then we moved it to the hotel where we were staying. And, uh, and somebody, I don't know who it was, who started, but somebody jumped into the pool. Uniform, you know, probably cleats and all, you know. And so we have some pictures there. Yeah, that's uh, everybody just celebrating. Um, somebody's getting thrown in the pool. Um, I don't know who that joker was. Um, but we celebrate, right? This is, I was thinking about celebrations, and, and we celebrate great accomplishments. We celebrated things that are important. We celebrate victories. We celebrate whatever. We celebrate differently uh, depending on what we're doing. 
Uh, in today's text, we're going to see uh, some people celebrate. They're going to celebrate that hope has arrived. Simeon, Mary and Joseph, and Anna, they celebrate that hope in the person of Jesus has finally, officially, bodily arrived. Look at verse 21 of Luke chapter 2 real quickly. and This is on the heels of last week as the shepherds made the announcement, uh, or the angels made the announcement to the shepherds and they went and found the baby who was in a manger. And look at verse 21. At the end of the eighth days, end of eight days when he was circumcised, this is baby Jesus, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now, this probably took place wherever they were staying, in a house or wherever they were staying. And, and there's three rituals that we're going to see uh, take place here. You see circumcision. Um, and then at 40 days old, there's another one where he's presented at the temple. Uh, and then the third ritual was purification of the, of the mother. And so at 40 days old, Jesus was taken to the temple according to the law of Moses to offer an appropriate sacrifice for him as the firstborn male. If you think about that, you remember what happened in the first Passover in Egypt? The last plague was the what? The last plague, number 10 death of the firstborn and so God smite the firstborn of all those in Egypt who didn't have blood over the door frame but you remember those who the Israelites who put the door over the door frame their babies were saved and so the redemption of the firstborn was required because the firstborn was spared by God and God said that firstborn belongs to me so the Israelite family would have to redeem their firstborn. And by doing so, they were acknowledging this baby belongs to God. And so the redemption price for a firstborn male was five sanctuary shekels. You can look at that up in November 18, I mean November, Numbers 18, uh, 16. And apparently the presentation of the firstborn, it never occurred earlier than 31 days after birth. And so the presentation of the child and the purification of the mother could be done on the same visit to the temple. So that's what's taking place in the text that Jeff read for us. Hold your spot there and look over to Leviticus chapter 12. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I do want to point this out. Leviticus chapter 12, hold your spot there in Luke 2. Leviticus chapter 12. So we have three different rituals taking place. One is circumcision. It's already happened eight days uh, after birth. And then here we have the presentation of the child and purification taking place, the same event. Two different rituals. But look at Leviticus chapter 12. This is describing in the law what should take place at the woman's purification. Leviticus 12, 1 through 8. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, If a woman conceives and bears a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days. As at the time of her menstruation, she shall be unclean. On the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. Then she shall continue for 33 days in the blood of her purifying. Chris Mack, I should have got you to read this text, brother. She shall not touch anything holy nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purifying are completed. But if she bears a female child, then she shall be unclean two weeks as in her menstruation, and she shall continue in the blood of her purifying for 66 days. Now, if you want to you you know why, what's the difference between male and female and what the time difference is, your small group leader will explain that <laughs> next week. Okay. If you're visiting with us, we have small groups. In the small groups, in our adult small group class, in our student classes, we teach through the same text, and uh, we just clean up whatever the preacher messes up. So there you go, small group leaders. Have fun with that. Verse 6, And when the days of her purifying are completed, whether for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting a lamb a year old for a burnt offering and a pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering. And he shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her. Then she shall be clean from the flow of her blood. This is... This is the law for her who bears a child, either male or female. And if she cannot afford a lamb, this is important for our text today, then she shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for her, and she shall be clean. 
Well, the sacrifice of the two turtle doves indicates that Mary and Joseph were indeed poor people. They didn't offer a lamb. They offered the turtle doves. And that was the provision for the poor. But Mary and Joseph, they were faithful to the Lord, doing all that they should do according to the law of Moses. You see that time and time again here in our text. And this is important, as this baby is going to grow up to be the teacher of Israel. So even from infancy, we see Jesus doing all that the law required. Verse 21, he circumcised on the eighth day, according to Genesis chapter 17, all males who would be part of Abraham's household, they should be circumcised. Verse 22, he's presented in the temple for Mary's purification. Verse 24, an offering was offered just like the law said. And in verse 27, verse 29, and verse 39, they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord. I mean, you can't imagine the Jews accepting an uncircumcised teacher whose parents had disobeyed the law. They just wouldn't go for that, would they? No, the obedience to the law was absolutely necessary for the salvation of every man, woman, boy, and girl who would trust in Christ. So let's think about where we are in our story. The nativity through the eyes of Luke. We're looking at chapter 1, chapter 2, wrapping things up today. After 400 years, God finally spoke through Gabriel, the angel, who told Zechariah that he and Elizabeth would have a, a child. He would be the forerunner, the herald to prepare the way for the Savior. So hope is announced. Six months later, hope was confirmed as Gabriel again delivers a message to Mary, telling her that even though she's a virgin, she'll have a child, and this child will be the son of the Most High, and he'll be a descendant of David, and he'll reign forever and forever and forever. Hope's confirmed. Mary did conceive by the Holy Spirit. She goes to her cousin's house, Elizabeth who was six months pregnant, and as Mary enters the house, the baby in Elizabeth's womb leapt at the arrival of the Christ child. And we see hope proclaimed as Elizabeth says to Mary, you're the mother of my Lord. Then Mary and Joseph, they travel to Bethlehem, the birthplace of the Messiah, and hope arrives. We saw that in last week's text. And when the baby Mary was carrying conceived by the Holy Spirit is born hope uh, hope is here hope took on flesh and today we'll see hope celebrated firstly it's celebrated by Simeon Simeon was a man in Jerusalem and what you keep in mind the times in which Simeon lived the Jewish religious leaders were, were at this point in, in history were thinking more politically and not so much spiritually. There had been no prophet in Israel for 400 years. Israel had been oppressed by one foreign power after another. And even now they're being ruled by the Romans under the corrupt leadership of Herod. Simeon could have easily got caught up in that and been skeptical. Maybe he could have question whether these great promises of God were ever going to come about. But instead, what do we see Simeon doing? Being righteous, being devout. He was godly. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. We see that three different times. Three references to the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 25. The Holy Spirit was upon him. Verse 26. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he wouldn't see death until he saw the Messiah. Verse 27, he came in the spirit into the temple. It, it sounds to me, it made me think about Jesus when he was in Luke chapter 4, a few chapters later. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. So here this man is godly. He's filled with the Spirit. He's led by the Spirit. And the Lord had revealed to him that he would see the Messiah in his lifetime. And it's kind of on his bucket list. Will and Candor, we know about bucket lists, right? I didn't know if y'all were going to be here or not. I didn't know if y'all were going to be in Iceland watching the volcano or what. Uh, people say, hey, you know Will's in Ireland? He and Cantor went there for da-da-da-da. And they're like, no, I didn't know that. They've got a bucket list of things they want to do. And, 
And if you don't know what that is exactly, uh, 2007, there was a movie called The Bucket List, and the plot was there's two terminally ill men, and they're trying to do things together. They got things on their list they want to do before they kick the bucket. Before Simeon kicked the bucket, he wanted to see the Messiah. He wanted to see the, the Christ. In this day, he happened to be in the temple as the baby Jesus was brought there. There's no halo. There's no Shekinah glory. There's just an ordinary Jewish couple bringing in a baby. But Simeon knew that this was a Messiah. This is the one he had been longing for, anticipating. It says that he, was, he had been anticipating the consolation of Israel. That's kind of a strange word, consolation of Israel. Just think of console. It means to comfort. Probably taken from Isaiah 40, verse 1 and 3. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. There's this comfort that he's longing for. Israel's in being oppressed by the Romans, spiritually in a really dark place. Some of you may be able to identify with the nation of Israel. Waiting on the comfort of Israel. So he's waiting on this comfort to come through the Messiah. And we can picture Simeon going over and taking the baby Jesus in his arms and Mary and Joseph not knowing who this man was, but he begins to give praise to the Lord. Look in verse 29. What can we learn from Simeon? I think we learn a couple things. Firstly, those that celebrate Christ don't have to fear death. Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. There's a Puritan pastor named Richard Baxter. He wrote a lot of books, and one of the books he wrote, The Saints' Everlasting Rest, in 1649. He writes this, For he that fears dying must be always fearing, because he hath always reason to expect it. And how can that man's life be comfortable who lives in continual fear of losing his comforts? But the one who celebrates Christ is not worried about so much the temporal things of this world. He's ready at any moment to depart and be with the Lord Jesus. Also, we learn from Simeon that those that celebrate Christ have their, their godly desires fulfilled. He'd been anticipating this, longing to see the Messiah, and he had those desires fulfilled. It, Think about what he was looking for. He probably was looking for a kingly figure, kingly type of man, like Saul, King Saul, right? Head taller than everybody else. Handsome. Able body. A capable leader. Or maybe he just thought of a valiant man riding on a white stallion. But what he actually saw, just ordinary folks going through the ritual of cleansing and presenting their little baby to the Lord. But the Holy Spirit says, right, spotlight, this is the one. He can now die a happy man. Sometimes the, the, that thought of our desires and God fulfilling our desires, sometimes that's confusing for me. We see in the Psalms, Psalmist write a lot about that, Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Really? Make you want to do this? Psalm 84, 11. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Psalm 34, 9. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. Really? Now, this doesn't mean that the Lord grants all our selfish wants. It's kind of like Psalm 23. You know that one, right? The Lord is our shepherd, I shall not want. 
Now, that didn't mean I get everything I desire, right? Because most of the things we want aren't really good for us. But each of these promises of the, those three psalms we read, those verses, they contain, contain a, a condition. He grants the desire of those who walk uprightly. He didn't grant desire just to any old joker, lives however he wants. No, to those who walk uprightly. They who seek the Lord will not lack any good thing. It doesn't say just any old joker, right, will not lack any good thing. He gives the desires of his heart to those who do what? Who delight in the Lord. When you delight yourself in the Lord, his desires become your desires. A little enigmatic, it really is. But if you think about it, if you've been a believer any amount of time, you can kind of understand what you're talking about. Because what happens as you walk with the Lord, as you study the scriptures, you memorize them, you're trying to obey the Lord, you desire to put him first, your desires change. His desires become your desires. The things you used to want to do all the time, you don't really necessarily want to do. In fact, some of the things you used to love to do, now you begin to despise and hate. He changes you. And so that's what this is talking about. God's desires becoming your desires. Your heart becomes more like God's heart. Your wants, your will becoming more like Jesus' wants and will. The focus of our prayers become not gimme, 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 right? But more like, Father, hallowed be your name. Your, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See how that kind of fits together? Not, Lord, I want, what my, I want my will. My kingdom come. No, it's Lord, your will and your kingdom come. If you're hoping your kingdom is going to come, your hope's going to be frustrated. If you're hoping for his kingdom to come, your hope will be lavishly fulfilled because God's kingdom will come in power and glory. Those who hope in Christ will be rewarded with an understanding of the things of God. And your godly desires will little by little be fulfilled. Also, what we learn from Simeon, those who celebrate Christ recognize that salvation is for all peoples. Look at verse 32. It will be a light for a revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And if you read the New Testament, it's really interesting how some of the religious leaders, they just forgot that. They're just a little confused on who salvation was for. Jesus Christ is not only the Savior of the Jews, but of any person from any nation who will call upon him. He may have been, Simeon may have been thinking about these passages, Psalm 98, verse 2 and 3. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Was Israel God's chosen people? Of course. Look at Isaiah 52.10. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Isaiah 42.6 and 7. I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations. Sound familiar? To open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. And in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, this is the promise given to Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, right? The father of the Jews. I will bless those who bless you, and I, him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth, shall be blessed. Not just Israel. All the families of the earth will be blessed. I think sometimes in, you read the New 
Testament and they'd forgotten salvation was for all who would believe. The only way of salvation is through the Messiah, this baby born in Bethlehem. That's true for the Jew and also for the Gentile. The one name whereby man and woman comes to God is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It's important. That's why the, Jesus sends out the disciples, Matthew 28, the Great Commission, we call it. He tells them to go out into all the world and preach the gospel, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Hope is celebrated by Simeon. Verse 33, hope is celebrated by Mary and Joseph as well. Think about this. Mary and Joseph, they're told by Gabriel they're going to have a son. Their son's going to be the Messiah. They marveled. And we've said this already. It wasn't that Mary was surprised that the Messiah would have a mother. No, someone's going to give birth to the Messiah. What blew her away is that it was her, that God had chosen her for this to take place. Think about all the grief they received. We can just imagine. We don't know exactly what went on. We're not told, but just imagine the grief. They're betrothed, they're engaged, but they're not yet married, and she's, you know, doing the... We, don't, we could have somebody demonstrate that, right? If I picked the timing right, but, you know, just this walking around, you know. Yeah, I, I just can't imagine the grief and what they went through dealing with all of that. But yet, here they were in Bethlehem where the Messiah was said to be born in and they had had their baby and it was a boy and they had given it the name Jesus as they were commanded. And now Simeon is confirming that this is the Messiah. My eyes have seen your salvation, he says. This is Mary and Joseph's kid. And they were amazed. They were marvel. They celebrated. Hope had arrived. And this is our son. Look at verse 36. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, the, the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin. And then as a widow until she was 84, she did not depart from the temple worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who are waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Simeon, godly older man, celebrating the arrival of hope, the Messiah born 40 days prior. And here we have another. Anna had been married for seven years, it says, and she was a widow until she was 84. How does she spend her days? So she remained single. She lived out her life in the temple, occupied with prayer and fasting, anticipating the arrival of the Messiah. Verse 37, it says she didn't depart from the temple. I don't think she lived there. I think she was just there a lot. Probably, most likely, knew old Simeon. And she worshipped. And it could be that Simeon called her over and said, Anna, come and see. And she had been waiting for, verse 38, the redemption of Jerusalem. I think you can see those synonymous with the consolation of Israel in verse 25. I think they're synonymous. I think there's much difference there. She was anticipating this moment, and now the Messiah was there in the temple. She had her eyes on him. and It's interesting. She talks about her devotion. Devotion to God takes many forms. What's that look like? Well, it always involves worship, and that's what she's been doing. It involves witnessing, and that's what she does, doesn't she? 
she gave thanks, verse 38, and to speak of him to all who are waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. I don't, I don't think that that meant she just went out and told everybody that she saw, possibly. I think what this is referring to, that there were people like her who trusted God, was believing God's word, that Messiah would come, and she's anticipating his arrival. And she goes and tells those people, people like her, hey, the Messiah is here. I saw him. And this is what Simeon said about them, that salvation has arrived. We see Simeon celebrate the coming of the Messiah. We see Mary and Joseph marveling, celebrating. Hope had arrived, and now Anna, a devoted widow, celebrating the coming of our Lord. So how do we apply this text as we close things down? Thinking about these folks celebrating. What about you this Christmas season? It's Christmas Eve. Christmas is here tomorrow. Are you celebrating the arrival of Christ? Are you celebrating the arrival of hope? It came 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem. Hope has arrived. We need to celebrate. And You know, really, you think about it, you either celebrate his birth or you get exposed by him. I mean, up to, up to this point, all the prophecies have been really positive. But look at verse 34. We kind of see the other side of the incarnation, don't we? And this is the first hint in Luke's gospel that Christ's coming would, wouldn't bring salvation to everybody. You know, the, the announcement by the angels to the shepherds. You remember last week? Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Sometimes we take that to mean, yeah, peace. He came for peace for everybody. Peace, peace, peace for all. Verse 34, And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. One thing he says, is, A sword will pierce through your own soul, Mary, because of your son. I mean, the rejection of her son by men will cause Mary to Witness of the death of her own son on a cross. The sword will pierce her her soul. I think about that. This child will cause the fall and rising of many in Israel. Other gospel writers and the apostles say Jesus is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. We see that in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe. The stone that their builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Some who are humble in heart, like Simeon and Anna, they'll be exalted as they embrace the the Messiah, God's Son. But others will be humbled. And what happens is Jesus' life, and as he grows up, his ministry is going to expose the inner hostility of those who oppose him. So you can't be neutral. You can't ride the fence of Christ. Either you embrace him, right, or you oppose him. It's kind of like the, the Lord with Christ. He, he draws a line in the sand. All for, all against. Either you acknowledge him as Christ and submit your life to his lordship and you rise in salvation or you you oppose him and you think, I'm going to do it my way and you'll fall in judgment. And I think about this. I I grew up here and so I know know a lot of folks and uh, I have some older people that I'm really close to and I really love a lot and love me 
and they're really good to me. And I could really say honestly with some of these folks as I'm thinking about them, man, they're really good people. But you know what happens sometimes to really good people? People that love you. People that you think love you and are really good to you. You know what happens when you share the, the gospel of Jesus with them? Their heart's exposed. And that's what this text says. There's going to be a rising. There's going to be a falling. See, people that are really, really good seem to be good-natured folks when you start telling them that, hey, Jesus came and he died for sinners. And that includes you and me. Because if we're really honest, we all... We all want to do it our way, right? We live opposed to God. And because of our opposition to the Lord, Scripture says that we're all culpable. We're all separated from the Lord. We really don't know God. We have these prayer times that we talk to God, but we really don't know God. Because He's holy and we're sinful. And the Bible says that we're really at enmity with Him. We're opposed to Him. But God created a way that we could, us sinful, rebellious people could be reconciled to him through the giving of his son. We celebrate Christmas. Jesus, God condescending. Holy God becoming a man and living among sinful people. Where he lived a a sinless, perfect life, fulfilling the law as we've seen, seen earlier. And he willingly gave up his life. He was arrested, put on, put on trial because of the religious leaders and in cahoots with the Romans. They put him to death on a cross. He died a terrible death, an agonizing physical death. But as he was on that cross, the Father poured out his wrath upon the Son. The innocent Christ bore the wrath of the Father. He did that on behalf of all those that will later believe on him. Jesus died, was buried. On the third day, he, he rose. And the Bible says he rose for our justification, meaning that he rose from the dead so that we could be made right with the Father. So we're, we're able to celebrate the birth of Christ, the incarnation. But you can only do that if you've embraced him, if you've yielded to him, if you've repented of your sin and you've trusted the work that he did on this earth, on the cross, and the resurrection. For some of us, we embrace Christ, and for some of us, we're exposed. I don't know if I'm ready for that. I hear that a lot. I don't know if I'm ready for that. I think that's true, but I don't know if I'm ready for that. There's no other way to be reconciled to God. There's no other way to know the Lord is embracing his son. Can you celebrate Or are you exposed? If you're not, I encourage you to just repent. Just by way of application today, just repent. Turn from living and rebellion against the Lord and embrace the Son. If you're not really sure what that's all about, you'd love to know more about that. We would love to talk to you about that. Second, second thing by way of application. We don't know much about Simeon's life. What did he do for a living? Mailman? Cop? Carpenter? Pharmacist? Do you own a furniture store? We don't know. It doesn't say. Hey, what do we do as men? We talk to somebody, we, even here, as, as I get to know you and, and you come maybe for the first time, I don't know why we do that. What do we ask, Kevin? For men, what do we, what do we ask? We shake hands. 
We eventually say what? What do you do for a living? I don't know. That's kind of important to us, I guess. It's part of what we, who we are, right? Makes up who we are and, I don't know, God taught. What do you do for a living? We don't know anything about Simeon. We don't know anything about Simeon. We just know he spent a lot of time worshiping the Lord. He was set apart because he, unlike so many religious leaders of his day, he, was, he trusted the Lord. He trusted in God's word. He was looking in anticipation for the coming Messiah. He didn't miss them. And when he saw them, he embraced them. And he worshipped them. What about Anna? Think about her life. Well, that's a lot of time at church. She didn't remarry. Didn't say anything about her having kids. And that's, that's wonderful. What do we know about Anna? She was faithful to the Lord. And I think when Simeon and Anna died, somebody had to do their funeral. I doubt, I doubt anybody said, man, they sure wasted their life. What about us? Today's our last day on earth. What would people say? Boy, he sure worked a lot. He sure made a lot of money. He sure had a lot of stuff. What will the Lord say? Would he say we've wasted our lives? Well, we live in America and we're really busy. Chasing, doing, getting her done. Simon and Anna, they knew what was important. You think, well, Preacher, what are we supposed to do? Stay at church all the time? No, you're supposed to go to work and honor the Lord in that way. I don't know what it looks like in your life. I'm just asking that for myself as well. And Let's reflect on that. Are we wasting our lives? If you died today, say, man, what do I spend my time doing? I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up. We're going to sing. They said, it don't matter, preacher, if you preach two hours, we're going to sing this song. I said, all right. <laughs> hey, if you've got a question, and you, you really can't say with your life, man, I'm really celebrating hope, and I, I don't know if I have been reconciled to God. I don't know if I've repented and trusted Christ. And you keep doing the thing with your hands. It's kind of like a, you know, just kind of what it looks like with our lives. And maybe you're doing that, and you're like, man, I don't want to live my life like that. And I'd love to understand that more we'd love to talk to you about that there's a lot of people in this room that love to talk to you about that. i would too i'll be the last one to leave today love to talk to you about that you can call me send me a text but if you're you're not a believer and you have been in rebellion against the lord but you've you've yet to embrace the son i want to encourage you to do that it's, salvation doesn't come any other way it only comes through christ and god wants you to be reconciled to him that's why he sent his son to live and to die that's why the Father poured out his wrath on the Son, so that sinners like me, like you, we could be in a relationship with God. That's a beautiful, amazing thing. The sinners could, could not just have a relationship with God, but have a relationship with God where God wants us to draw near to him. We don't have to kind of ease into the throne room. No, we can come boldly because of what Christ has done for us. Isn't that a beautiful thing? And maybe you're like, man, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'd love to talk to you about that. Church, let's be people who live worthwhile lives. And I don't, I don't know what that looks like for you. 
Are we spending time doing what we need to be doing? The word says that the word can make the simple wise. And may the Lord do that today through the teaching of his word. Okay. We're going to pray and then we're going to sing. And this is going to be our benediction and we're going to go home. If you're visiting with us, man, we're so glad you're here. Put your little guest card in that box. I won't show up at 630 in the morning. I won't hound you, but I will send you a little something about our church. Uh, and then we'll send you information when we're having things at our church. But, um We'd love for you to do that for us. Tonight, if you don't have anything going on, 5 o'clock, uh, Morgan is uh, heading the show. 540, 545, he guarantees we're going to be out of here. So if you have a family shindig, what, we started doing this a few years ago and just really encouraging people to say, hey, bring your family. I know you got family stuff going on. If you can bring them, bring them. Some of you can, I get it. But if you can, come and and. We'll be out of here at 5 forward, then you can go do your family stuff. If, if you can't be here, Lord bless you. We have a lot of people out. There's people traveling. A lot of our families are out. We've got flu. We did COVID about a month ago, right? It kind of ran through our crew, and now we're doing flu and strep. And so we got a lot of people with that, and a lot of, lot of you know, we've got empty places. And, and so we got a lot of people out. So we'll be in prayer for them. Um, but we'd love for you to come tonight, bring family, bring friends. It's going to be a real short and sweet service. Let me pray. And then we're going to sing, and this is going to be our benediction. So glad you're here. Merry Christmas to you. Stand up and let's pray. Father, you are good to us because you give us your word, and it's powerful. It's effective. It, it convicts and encourages and empowers. And, Father, I just pray that you would use it. Use your gospel message to, to prick the hearts of people who are yet to embrace the Son. And, Lord, there's, there's some maybe that they can't celebrate hope because they're hopeless, because they have not Christ. I pray that you would take this gospel message that they've heard and just allow it to ring loud in their ears. And Father, I pray that, that people felt loved and encouraged and accepted and, and all that today as they come to Beaver. But Father, most importantly, I just pray that they would know you do a work in our hearts. And Father, for those of us who are believers, who've been born again, we've been redeemed, we can, we can celebrate hope, we can, we've embraced the Son, we recognize, Father, that's because of the work you've done in our lives. And Lord, we deserve nothing but your wrath. We deserve nothing but your judgment. But we're so thankful for the work you've done in us. And Father, we do want to live lives that are purposeful, that are meaningful. We don't want to waste our lives. And Father, if there's, for all of us, for me, Father, if there's things I'm doing that's wasting time, wasting energy, doing things that I don't need to do, Lord, just bring conviction and clarity to my thoughts and my heart. And for all of us here at Beaver, that you would do that, that we would live lives pleasing to you. Father, we are thankful for the season. We're thankful for the good music we get to sing and thankful for the gifts and cards and all the encouragement and all the goodies and just what a sweet season this is. Father, be with those that are traveling, seeing family today. Give them travel mercies. For all those that are sick, we have flu and strep. We just ask that you would just give them a lot of grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together.
Thank you.